Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNAT TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Tuesday, July 19th. We're continuing with our series of interviews and discussions with candidates who are running for a statewide office uh, this year uh, in advance of the primary election that will be held on August 9th. And today it's our pleasure to talk with Gerald Malloy, who is running for the U.S. Senate in the Republican Party primary that will be held on August 9th. He's a former U.S. Army officer, a graduate of West Point. He retired after 22 years in the Army as a major. Since then, he's been in business management and executive positions with large and small businesses, lending support to a wide range of U.S. government organizations, and he lives in Perkinsville, Vermont. Mr. Malloy, thank you very much for making the time for our conversation today, and welcome to the News Project. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to start off with the same basic question I've asked every other candidate I've talked to in this uh, round of conversations. What made you decide to throw your hat in the ring for uh, the Senate? So it goes back, actually, to about day one of the Biden administration, and I was uh, kind of alarmed. Uh, some of the un what I think are unconstitutional uh, executive orders that he put in place right uh, from the get-go. Um, kind of concern grew, and then I watched Afghanistan. I think that was a, a debacle. I think the whole world watched that, and it's having some second, third order effects of that performance there, but uh, I, I blame our commander in chief for that, not our military. Uh, uh, I have great faith in our military. Um, Mr. Senator Leahy made his announcement that he was going to uh, retire, and that's when the thought first prop popped into my mind. And I uh, took a you know good look at myself and my career. Um, that was, I think, mid-November. January and February, I went out and started campaigning across uh, the state of Vermont, and I heard directly from at this point, many thousands of Vermonters that they're ready for a change. They see the leadership failure, that we're going in the wrong direction. And in looking at myself, uh, I, I, I have 42 years of relative experience. And that's, uh, as you mentioned, from West Point, my military service, I've worked with about 20 NATO partners and allies. I have nuclear surety experience, full to gap, DMZ, uh, combat experience in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. I, I actually was an operations officer leading a, um, operations across 400 kilometers, firing 650 MLRS and helping defend an ally, liberate an ally, and defeat an aggressor. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, I went five years working uh, with many government agencies, DOD, DHS, across the law enforcement community, worked in 20 presidential disaster declarations, some of them right here in Vermont. Um, and, you know, going back to my career uh, in the Army a little bit, I actually did the training for a lot of Vermont units, National Guard and Reserve component units. I was part of the ROTC headquarters uh, that was responsible for New England. Uh, so I actually trained quite a bit with UVM and Norwich. So uh, putting all those pieces together, uh, I actually, oh, the last step for me was watching the State of the Union. And I actually had a bad feeling, sinking feeling of uh, we're, we're heading in an unrecoverable direction. And so I looked at, uh, um, I guess the other piece I forgot to mention is last 11 years I've been in business. So I've been in mostly in Washington, D.C. area, providing services <clears throat> to U.S. government organizations. Uh, and that what I do there, I think, is highly relevant in that I engage and I listen to issues and problems and requirements and I develop solutions. Highly competitive environment, very cost conscious environment. I've been successful there working uh, mostly Department of Defense, but many other U.S. government organizations, again, as I said, down in D.C., I have an MBA, I have a graduate certificate also from Georgetown. I looked at that and I said, I, I, uh, I think I'm the right person for this job. And I also looked at the competition. And again, uh, you know, even some of the things I've mentioned to you, there's no senator, you know, right now with some of that experience. Uh, so I think between that and the, the competition here, I, I do not think Mr. Welch is the right person to, to you know, lead the future uh, as a senator for Vermont. Um, for, for a variety of reasons. I can talk more about that, but uh, that's what got me uh, into this. It's been great. Six months on campaigning, six months plus, and I'm feeling very, very good about the primary August 9th. And then I've met Mr. Welch a few times in the last few weeks, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the um, general election in November. So this would be your first time then running for public office? Yes, yes it, it is my first time. I will say I, I, at West Point I had a concentration in political science, but uh, no, I, I can 
I will tell you that when I was in my office and I, I saw my phone as Senator Leahy retired and I, I thought about it. That's when I first thought about it. And then, like I said, I took stock of, of myself and my career and boots on the ground, seeing Vermonters across the state, um, very receptive, you know, for me and, and my background. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, it is my first time. Look at some of the uh, positions that you've uh, stated there, uh, I guess some of the things that are kind of key components to your campaign. And one of the things that's listed there is economic prosperity. Uh, sure. Tackle a $30 trillion debt and reduce the size of the federal government. Uh, um, and that, uh, so I guess that means you would like to see the federal budget being trimmed a little bit. Would that be good? Oh. Well, I, I want responsibility and, and accountability. And so, yes, my, my platform in line with the Republican Party is to get back to abiding by the Constitution, uh, get back to actually promoting the opportunity for economic prosperity. And the third piece is uh, ensuring defense, security and order. Uh, I, I think those are the areas right now that uh, our, our leadership is failing us. And as you mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier that crusade. Uh, to kill the oil and gas industry. I want to return to having oil and gas uh, energy independence. Um, that is that is the reason we have five, six, seven dollar a gallon gas right now in our heating oil. And we're coming up on winter here, so it's going to be a, a bigger problem. Um, the, the overspending, uh, which uh, my potential future opponent has been a rubber stamp on, uh, you know, overspending it to the tune of trillions is is the cause for the 9.1 inflation that we're experiencing right now, 40, 40 year high. I think we are about to go into a recession. And I think, I think maybe even later this week, we're going to get another one point increase on, on the basis rate, which is going to further uh, increase our, our interest payments. You know, if we, yeah, I think we're at 1.75 or 2.0, if we get into the fives for that, which we very well could do if we want to keep trying to tamp down the inflation, we're we're imposing on ourselves uh, billions and billions of you know, many many billions of dollars of additional payments. So, um, yeah, th those were a couple of things. I, I would say that you know in what I see over the last year and a half has been. Uh, I want to get back to uh, abiding by the Constitution. Uh, I do look for a limited government that actually promotes uh, the economy less control, less spending, like you mentioned, uh, to get, you know, uh, we can't, $30 trillion debt, we just cannot keep adding to that. It's, it's not healthy for our economy. Well, let me ask you about the, uh, the inflation piece. And I mean, there's several points you raised there that are kind of intriguing, but um, when, you, when, uh, when you talk about 9% inflation, isn't it fair to say that uh, much of that is due uh, to the COVID pandemic and the supply chain interruptions that are caused. And then following that up with the war in Ukraine, uh, you know, that uh, caused uh, energy prices, uh, natural gas and oil to, uh, to really go up at that point. You know, you subtract the war in Ukraine and COVID, but I'm not sure uh, where I, uh, you get the inflation from. I don't either, but uh, I did take uh, economics at West Point and in my, in my MBA, I, I look back to, I think it was Milton Friedman that talks about, you know, if you increase the M2 money supply, if you print off money and inject it into the economy, which is what we've done, you are going to get inflation. I would say <clears throat> part of that uh, <clears throat> is the gas prices, uh, where we've gone from in the twos to in the five, six and sevens. Uh, I consider that... <clears throat> self-inflicted by the Biden administration with that, as I mentioned, crusade to kill the oil and gas industry. We had oil and gas independence. We had a surplus uh, of trade on oil and gas, and he stopped that on day one. And he continues to stop that. And it's some of the other things he's done, uh, you know, like reaching out to Venezuela to try to, and tapping into the strategic oil reserve. Those, are, that, those aren't the answers. I think you should re remove that executive order. Uh, so that you know, so the United States can have oil and gas independence. And you, you talked about Ukraine and Russia. Yes, that's been that has been disruptive, um, and, and that you know has and is possibly going to have further impact on uh, our food supply. And food independence is one of my when I mentioned defense, security, and order. Uh, one of the things I look to promote 
is to increase the food independence along with oil and gas independence uh, here in the United States. I think that might be the next uh, major crisis coming down the road, particularly, well, it goes back into foreign policy because I actually believe um, through, there were many opportunities for the United States to uh, have a different outcome or even prevent uh, Russia from invading Ukraine. And that goes back to you know what how we displayed ourselves in withdrawing from Afghanistan. I think Russia watched that, and I think that day they decided. Now, even at that point, I think there were many things the United States could have done. Uh, uh, you know, for Ukraine uh, to improve their situation. One of them. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned I was a MLRS ATACMS commander and supervised their operations in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. 38 of them at one point at the end of Desert Storm. I fired 650 MLRS rockets. And I wrote an article about that for Vermont Daily Chronicle months ago about it, that system being a game changer. I spent five years at Fort Bragg rotating through an 18 hour recall. Get the phone call, you're on a plane in 18 hours with that system. Uh, why it has taken us months and months and months to get four HIMARS systems to Ukraine is beyond me. Well, wouldn't that be sort of uh, due to trying to avoid crossing, uh, well, I guess the term is red lines, or trying to avoid uh, just getting embroiled in a deeper conflict with, uh, with Russia? I mean, True. had we sent those HIMARS systems to Ukraine on February 25th, let's say, the day after the Russian invasion, uh, maybe that might have triggered a much worse outcome than what we're seeing right now. True, and you, you heard me mention, I do have nuclear surety experience. I, re I realize that escalation was and is, uh, continues to be a possibility, but I, I would go back, you know, when we all watched that 26 mile convoy sit there for eight days, uh, for me as a field artillery officer, that was hard to watch because I actually think we probably could have, probably could have maybe even ended that aggression right then and there. It with it with airstrikes too. Also, yes, A tens combined force we could have. Um, let me just move on here to a couple of things. You mentioned uh, uh, energy and oil and gas uh, security there, and I, again, I see on your website you're you're in favor of restarting the Keystone Pipeline. Yeah, um, isn't that though a pipeline that runs from Canada down to well the Gulf ports? Uh, that was simply export uh, that very heavy Canadian oil. I, I mean. How would that add to the U.S. oil supply and independence? That would just that would be one piece. I think a, a bigger, uh, well, a bigger or as big portion of that is I think we've seen the president double down and triple down on keeping in place and putting in place barriers to uh, oil and gas production and development here within the U.S. And industry sees that, and that's I think that's one of the reasons we have the high gas prices. I will also say that you see on there. I'm, I'm very much in favor of uh, the United States developing future uh, energy capabilities, uh, solar, wind, electric. However, for us to try to kill the oil and gas industry and back into that is, is not what we should be doing because we're subjecting you and I and everybody else to these gas prices and oil prices to heat our homes. So it gets minus 22 here in the winter, as you know. And, but uh, right now, uh, in terms of um, Green New Deal, we, we, we simply do not have access or ownership of the uh, uh, lithium, cobalt, uh, nickel, uh, other uh, resources uh, for that plan. We don't, we don't, so we don't have the resources. I, I realize we have an in infrastructure bill that has passed $5 billion. That's That's going to take some time. We don't have an implementation, implementation plan. And, you know, you can read different estimates of you know, well, well in the trillions about implementing that new green deal type plan. That is, uh, there's no pain, there's no plan there. And uh, what I would look to do is take a step back, reevaluate, start to make sure we have the resources. And then I think most importantly, it's kind of windy out here, but uh, sorry. Um, most importantly, we got to get buy-in from the people, the American people, what, what they want to do, not, not just our president. Um, but do you think, though, that, uh, you know, with the concerns about climate change, global warming, that, uh, you know, now's the oh. time really to double down on the solar or renewable uh, sources of energy, 
you know, and while we, in the short term, perhaps need to maintain oil and other fossil fuels, uh, the goal should be to kind of really invest as much as possible in alternatives that would not heat the planet like we seem to be seeing in, right. parts oh, of in the Midwest. I, I'm in favor of investment, getting, getting industry to develop the capabilities. Uh, I, I am in favor of that, but what, what I'm not in favor of is backing into it without a plan, without the resources. But yeah, and uh, uh, you know, no one likes being outside more than I do. I'm outside now, but uh, you know, the climate and, and uh, the environment and emissions. Yes, I, I want to you know have plans that uh, positively impact all those areas. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, kind of backing into it, and I, you know, I said I, I don't have the solar farm here to flip on the switch Saturday night. I, most of us don't, so and we don't have the resources or the infrastructure or plan to go to that at this point. I, another uh, point I noticed on your website was that you seem to have a concerns about illegal immigration, and and if I understood it correctly, you were in favor of uh, building the wall along the Mexican southwestern yeah. border uh you think the wall was, was would have been a viable solution to illegal immigration from mexico well, and other parts of latin america i i think we i am in favor of building the wall along our southern border and i can tell you a little bit of background on that i worked with dhs and dod uh uh 15 years ago talked with the drugs are directly about how the situation was down there he said it's absolutely out of control we need a wall that's 15 years ago Part of my uh, uh, equation there is, uh, and I've seen this you know, firsthand, not firsthand, but I've, I've been impacted by it, is the fentanyl that's coming into our, our country. So that is uh, a synthetic opioid. It's being made in China. The Communist Party is well aware of that, and they're pumping it in mostly through the southern border, and it's the largest region for the 100,000 overdose deaths that we're experiencing now in the United States. And when I say personal, my best friend from high school, his son down in Florida, recently died of a fentanyl overdose. Uh, so I, I look actually, you know, we have immigration laws. I look to actually enforce those laws and put up, put up the wall to uh, curb at some level, uh, or hopefully a great level, uh, the amount of fentanyl coming in through the southern border. Um, Last year, the United States seized uh, 10,000 pounds of fentanyl. That's enough to kill 2 billion people. So I call that chemical warfare. So it's a, along with my, um, you might have seen up there, I am in favor of uh, stepping back and, and looking at countries, uh, taking a close look at countries that I don't think we should be trading with, or, or need, we stop at, at, at certain, certain levels. Um, so if a country is a communist country or has uh, human rights violations or is pushing drugs into our country or has unfair trade practices, well, let's look at China. Check, 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 check. I think we should be putting more um, uh, sanctions on China. And I know I'm getting away from the wall piece a little bit, but more, more sanctions on China. Uh, and I think the second order effect, I do realize they would that would be disruptive, but I think in the long term, it'd be better for our country. Uh, for instance, if we stop importing a, a widget from China, maybe some industrious Vermonter down in Precision Valley fires up a factory and starts making that widget. Now we have made in Vermont, made in America. That's what I'd like to see. But to answer your question, I am in favor of putting up the wall. Um, and, and that, you know, I realize there are, well, I think there's economic impacts and crime impacts related to that. Uh, but, you know, putting up the wall and actually enforcing our immigration laws. I, w I wanted to ask you a foreign policy question, you know, growing out of your extensive experience in that area, you know, in your, through your military career. I, um, and I, I'm taking it from your last answer that you see China as the major foreign policy challenge facing the U.S. at the moment. Would that be fair to say? Yes, it is. Um, so uh, you said a moment ago, I think, uh, if I heard correctly, uh, that we should put more sanctions, economic sanctions, I'm assuming, uh, on China. What, what sort of sanctions would you favor? I mean, one of the, one of the other drivers of inflation I've, I've read uh, is the fact that we, uh, during the previous administration, the tariffs were put on Chinese products and those raised the prices of those mm -hmm. products to American consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, so how would we put in sanctions that wouldn't have that effect of raising prices here 
they might have some effect. And that's why I said it could be disruptive. And I know there are companies with a lot of uh, you know, substantial trade in China. I would like to at least get back to a uh, level, at, at least level. I think China has a you know, surplus coming into the United States at this point. Uh, I know, as I mentioned, I, I saw just recently, uh, for instance, Volkswagen is thinking of pulling out of China. I think uh, you might have seen recently, very recently, the China is starting to call for a communist cell in businesses such as BlackRock that operate in China. Okay, so that's very recent. But um, um, and I think you've also probably seen some recent, uh, you know, further news about you know, intellectual property be, being stolen from the United States and ending up in China. So uh, that's why I said that, you know, take a take a step back and take a look at, at certain areas, industries where we could ideally with the least disruption um, in, impose sanctions. And, uh, I, you know, I, I even spoke about this last night. In, in reality, you know, you look at Ukraine and, and Russia, and if we're, you know, buying $60 million, of, you know, in oil a day from Russia, we're funding Russia. And, and I don't want to, I don't want to be funding China anymore, because I do think they're thinking about taking action against Taiwan. Um, talk a little bit about that. You know, most of the semiconductors in the world are made there. One thing that I've advocated on the campaign trail is to immediately, uh, you know, I talked about oil and food. I think semiconductors might be the third one <clears throat> to, you know, move towards uh, better independence in that area. Because if uh, something does happen between China and Taiwan, I think it very well could, um, that'll be hugely disruptive uh, to the world. Now, right, you know, here right in Burlington, we have some great capacity. I'm, uh, I'm in favor of increasing that capacity here in the United States. So we're not as dependent on, on for instance, Taiwan. Uh, I think we could actually do that in a partnership with Taiwan. Um, but we, we should do that. I'd be in favor of that. One proposal I've heard uh, this uh, currently before Congress, I think it's passed the House, but kind of stalled in the Senate, uh, is to uh, spend, I think it was $52 billion to uh, invest yep. in two uh, semiconductor plants here in the U.S. growing out of precisely the concern you just mentioned there about how I think it's roughly 90% of the world's semiconductor produ yep. uh, production of advanced semiconductors is currently in Taiwan. Uh, if you were elected, would you uh, support that uh, expenditure? Yes, I, w I would. Um, and I, I'm going to mess up the details. I know that's, that's tied up against Build Back Better right now, I think is actually what's going on, um, I believe, in, in the Senate. Um, but yes, I, 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 that, that, that is part of, uh, I would agree with that. That's something, uh, as I mentioned, I think, to you, you know, as we see the world today, I think we need to ensure we have uh, independence in, in many critical areas. That, that would be one of them. Um, just to kind of go to a couple of current events uh, type things real quick, uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, you know, guns and abortion have been on the headlines a lot uh, growing mm -hmm. out of the recent Supreme Court decisions. I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about where you stand on those two issues. Um, I've stated, well, you saw my, my website, uh, you know, I, I'm looking to get back to abiding by the Constitution. I, I took that oath, uh, the same oath a U.S. Senator takes and support and defend the Constitution and served under that well and faithfully for, for 22 years. So I, I'm a firm believer in the Constitution and my uh, opinion that uh, Roe v. Wade, um, per the Tenth Amendment, uh, should, should have been overturned, and lo and behold, it was. And so I am in favor of that, that it goes to the states, respectively, and the people. Uh, I am pro-life, and I will, uh, you know, look as a, as a Vermonter to, for instance, vote against Prop 5 and Article 22, and uh, make my decisions on who I uh, vote for in Vermont elections uh, based on, on in, in, large, in part, on that issue. In terms of the uh, Second Amendment, uh, I'm not in favor of any infringements whatsoever on the Second Amendment. And I, you know, Uvalde and Buffalo were, were tragedies. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I looked at, uh, and I've spoken about this, I think we have a, a mental health issue here in the United States. And uh, I don't mean to sound harsh, but that, you know, that weapon didn't, didn't drive itself to the guy's, uh, you know, grandmother and, and chewed her and then over to the school. It was a, 
it was a young man that, that uh, uh, had mental health issues. And what I look for is, um, you know, in the United States, uh, and I saw, I saw the bill that was pushed together, kind of, kind of raced through. Um, I am fully in favor of increasing the mental health capacity and resources in the United States. You know, we used to have, uh, I think it was about 300 beds uh, per 100,000 people for mental health um, in hospitals. We're down in the teens now in the state, in the country. And um, <clears throat> uh, so that, that's the area I, I would focus on. Uh, yeah, uh, and clearly uh, there's a need to uh, spend more money there and raise salaries for people who might be interested in going into that field because uh, I, I know that there's right now uh, <laughs> you, you you wouldn't you wouldn't live well on a, on, a, on the salary there. Um, um, just real quick, I mean, what, before we have to run, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, you know, one of one of the big issues that seems to be going on, uh, sort of nationwide, is this whole business of polarization and uh, you know cultural division, uh, cultural warfare, to put it uh, kind of crudely. I guess uh, if you're elected, do, do you feel you'd be able to work across the aisle with Democrats or people that may not share your views and try and you know come up with proposals or ideas that would be compromises or kind of uh, meet folks halfway or or uh, what do you think we need to do in order to kind of get back to a period when that seemed to be the norm? I mean, it may not have been the case in actuality, uh, but it just seemed like there was an atmosphere where uh, there was a sense folks from uh, opposing views could work together. I would say it's a mix, but uh, because I, I see, I believe there's been a leadership failure now, if, uh, and I want to move forward with a re unified Republican Party effort. Now, having said that, um, you know, part of my success in the last in business, for instance, is developing relationships. So I can tell you if I'm going to go support a Army or Navy, or Air Force, Marine organization, having a relationship there is very important. And so, you know, as long as uh, something isn't um, infringing on the Constitution, I, I am I am all ears to to work through. And because one of the things I said at the beginning, I, you know, what I think is important for a U.S. Senator is actual performance. And, you know, uh, for instance, you know, my potential opponent, if you look at his record in 15 years and like, not seeing a lot there in terms of actual performance for Vermonters and the country. Um, so I would look to, yes, I would look to, to get things done to improve, uh, you know, the future for our country. Um, but if it, you know if it's going to be something uh, along the lines of infringing on, for instance, Second Amendment or other, uh, you know, liberty, freedoms, or rights, then the answer is no. That's a non-starter. Well, unfortunately, we're going to, have to leave it there for today, uh, Mr. Malloy. I, uh, I again, I think, wow, <laughs> we could talk for another half an hour easily about uh, many of these issues we've talked about. But uh, well, who knows? Maybe we'll have another opportunity after uh, after August ninth. I would love to, sir. I, uh, I'm looking forward to August 9th. I'm having an open house here at my home, Deploy Malloy, uh, this Sunday, and you're welcome, and everyone's welcome. Uh, I live down in Perkinsville, so if you go to deploymalloy.com, and you can come to my house and meet me and my family. Um, it's been a, a great campaign, and I want to serve Vermonters, serve Vermont, and serve the United States uh, for a better future. And I always like to say, may the 14 stars shine bright. May God bless America. All right. Well, thanks again for making the time for this conversation today, uh, Mr. Malloy. And uh, well, we'll see you out there on the campaign trail. Mm -hmm.